I, let's start with a story which actually took place after I finished my most recent book, which is a, a sort of the story of venture capital, mostly about Silicon Valley and the financing of companies from, you know, Apple way back in the day, Intel, Fairchild, right up to, you know, WeWork and Uber and the US-China tech rivalry. Uh, so after my book came out, all kinds of people contacted me. And in particular, there was an investor from Axel Capital, one of the top VC partnerships. And this guy was doing investments in Bangalore, India. And he wanted to get in touch, and so we set up a Zoom call, and uh, he explains you know, his story. And his story is basically, he's an Indian, he's a technologist, he goes to the US, he works for Intel, he gets a business degree from MIT. And after he spent a while there, India is starting to, to kind of accelerate economically. He comes back in 2010, sets up in Bangalore and starts making investments. You know, I'm a financial historian. I love to understand how stuff changes over time. So I said, okay, so 2010, you come back to Bangalore. Uh, tell me how the tech scene was in 2010 and tell me how it is today. So he said, okay, well, in 2010, I meet some founders, I do some investments, and after a few months, one of these company founders comes to me and says, I need some help. Now, venture capitalists think of themselves as service industry people. You know, they're there to give advice on how to go to market, how to raise the next round of money, whatever it is. And so the venture capitalist says, you want some help? Sure, I'm here, I'm here to help. What do you want? And the uh, founder of the company says, I want to get married. And the VC says, oh, why are you coming to me about that? You want to marry me or what's the deal? And the founder says, no, I want to marry my girlfriend, but you see her father thinks that I'm an entrepreneur and entrepreneur equals loser. And so no can do, the marriage can't go ahead because my prospective father-in-law is blocking it. But you, Mr. Venture Capitalist, you have status, you have standing, you've been to MIT Business School, you've worked for Intel. If you call my prospective father-in-law and explain to him that entrepreneur does not equal loser, then I'll be able to get married. So the VC thinks about it, he thinks, well, you know, marriage intermediation services is not really what I thought it was doing, but <laughs> okay. So he calls up the uh, prospective father-in-law, he explains that entrepreneur does not equal loser, the marriage goes ahead, everybody's happy. So I say, okay, that's a good story. Um, what is it like today? Are you still doing these uh, phone calls to prospective father-in-laws? And the VC says to me, no. Today in India, all of the prospective father-in-laws are watching the TV show Shark Tank in Hindi. Uh, and so I don't need to make these calls anymore. And I told this story actually to a, an Indian American friend. Uh, and she said to me, yeah, you know, and what's more, you can track the dowry value of entrepreneurial husbands uh, on these, you know, these, these kind of uh, wedding or, or sort of, there's a marriage market which gets, you can look in the papers and see who's offering what. And, and in fact, the price of entrepreneurs on this dowry market has gone up in the last decade. So I have, I have empirical data to back up the anecdote. <laughs> um, but there's a serious point to the story, right? Which is that culture is not static. Right? Culture changes. You can have an anti-entrepreneurial culture in 2010, which becomes pro-entrepreneurial a dozen years later. And I, my, my thesis is that having looked at venture capital and what it does to tech ecosystems, that this is happening all over the world. And that makes me super optimistic about the future. Since my book came out about three months ago, I've given talks to audiences all over the place. And when I speak in you know, to groups in Berlin or Paris or London or whatever, I mean, they're not necessarily as forward thinking as this group here. I mean, thinking digital, that not everybody is quite as advanced as you guys. So I get this pushback and people say to me, you know, Sebastian, you tell me this nice story about the history of Silicon Valley, the starting of the, all these companies, you know, Facebook and Google and all this, whatever. You know, that's cool in Silicon Valley, but those guys are kind of weird out there, right? They drink something in the water, they breathe something in the air. They seem to think, that failure is a learning experience. I mean, here, you know, in, in Berlin, we think failure is failure and that's it. Uh, and, and we're never gonna be like Silicon Valley. And I tell them, no, culture is not static, culture changes. And in fact, Silicon Valley itself illustrates this reality. So back in the 1950s, the classic business book 
in the United States was called Organization Man. It was the, it was the analysis of sort of the white collar working culture where you joined a company when you got out of university and you worked there loyally until your 60th birthday when you retired with a gold watch. It was the era of big business, big labor, big government, hierarchy, loyalty, no entrepreneurship. And then suddenly into this ecosystem arrived venture capitalists. And they started to tell people, oh, you've got an idea, you're working for this big company, why don't you go and start your own company? And bit by bit, entrepreneurship started to happen as these venture capitalists liberated talent from inside the big hierarchical companies. And that's why I refer to venture capitalists as this venture capital is really liberation capital. And again, the story about India, the story about early Silicon Valley, it's happening all over the place. Everywhere you go, you've got an environment where let's say there's a big company, right? And somebody halfway up the, uh, the research department has an idea. And the boss of the department says, I don't like your idea, we're not doing your idea. Now, he might say that because it's a bad idea, but he might also say that because there's this thing called the innovator's dilemma, right? You've probably heard of this, the idea that in a big company, you have an established business, it's going really well, you're making money, so you don't wanna, you don't wanna back a disruptive notion from inside the corporation that will cannibalize what you've got going on over here, which is already making tons of cash. So that's why, you know, the, the sort of, most of the ideas behind the Apple computer actually came from the company Xerox, but they didn't want a paperless office run by personal computers because their business was photocopying. So although they invented things like the graphical user interface and the mouse and so forth, they did nothing with it until Steve Jobs visited their office one day, stole all the ideas, and, and did the Mac. Um, that is the innovator's dilemma. Good ideas inside big companies frequently get squashed. And no, normally that's the end of the story. But now imagine we introduce the venture capitalist into the equation. And the frustrated inventor halfway up the big corporation, you know, is at a party or a bar or wherever, you know, and meets this person, the investor, and says, I've got this idea, but it's frustrating, but I, I can't do it. And the VC will say, sure, you know, start a company. And the person halfway up, the big company who's got a decent salary, a pension plan and all that, says, yeah, but I, I don't have any capital to, to, to start my own company. I, how do I do it? I don't have the money. And the VC says, capital, that's me. I raise capital. I'll bring the capital. Don't worry about it. And then the person halfway up, the big company, says, yeah, but you know, how do you even form a company? There are legal documents. Don't worry, says the VC, I do this all the time. I know exactly how to get this sorted. My friend, the lawyer that I'll call in, it, it'll all be fixed. And then the uh, prospective entrepreneur says, um, yeah, but to build a prototype, I'm gonna need three or four really top class engineers to come join me in my little company and help me to build a prototype. And the VC says, yep, yeah, I got a Rolodex. I will call people, we can interview them together. You need four great engineers to help you at the beginning. I'll help you to find them. And then the uh, would-be entrepreneur says, yeah, but you know, my little company is, is risky, right? It might fail. Most startups do fail. And so the good engineers, they're all working for Google, or they're working for Microsoft or whatever. Why would they risk leaving their nice jobs to come join a risky startup? And the VC will say, yeah, you're right. Startups are risky. But I'm gonna tell these people that if they join this startup, and it fails, but they've done a good job, it failed for some other reason, I will find them a new job in a different startup that I'm also backing. Venture capitalists circulate around innovation ecosystems, connecting ideas and money and people so that these inputs combine in the best possible way to produce applied science and progress. And so when you introduce the venture capitalist, you have not a single game where failure is really scary, you have a repeat game where the venture capitalist might recycle you into another position later, de-risking the experience of joining a startup. So I always remember the story about Eric Schmidt, who, who I was talking to quite a bit when I was writing my book. Eric Schmidt was the chief executive of Google, but he was not the founder. You know, Larry uh, Page and, and, uh, and, and Sergey Brin started Google as graduate students at Stanford. And they were doing pretty well. They raised uh, $25 million. The search um, technology was way outperforming all of the rivals. But to build actually a, 
a machine that would monetize this search engine to build a real company, they needed a more experienced chief executive. And so the venture capitalists found Eric Schmidt as a person who could join them, an older computer scientist who'd had experience as a CEO at another software company. And they brought Eric Schmidt along to be the chief executive of Google. And Eric Schmidt was kind of doubtful about whether he wanted to do this because clearly Larry and Sergey, the young punks who were the founders and who had retained a lot of voting power on the board, could fire him whenever they wanted to. And basically, Larry and Sergey were of the view that anybody aged over about 30 was dumb by definition. And so for Eric Schmidt, it was a risk. And here he was, a chief executive, quite established. Why would he join these, these, these young you know, rebels who might bump him out at any time? And he kind of didn't want to do it. But the venture capitalist, John Doerr, said to him, Eric, if you join Google, and if those punks kick you out, I'll make you chief executive of another portfolio company. Take it from me, take the risk, because it's not really a risk. So when people in my audiences in Europe say to me, those guys in Silicon Valley, they're crazy, they think that failure is a learning experience. That is true, not because of something that you drink in the water in Silicon Valley. It's true because venture capitalists are there to turn single games into repeat games, de-risking the experience. Now, you know, don't get me wrong. I understand entrepreneurship is always scary. It's always a tough road. It's always quite likely, statistically, that your startup won't make it, because that's just the truth about startups. It's a really tough road. But it is less tough when a venture capitalist is there to help you to find the money, help you to incorporate the company, help you to make your first four hires, help you to meet the customers that you need to sell to, and just help, you know, turn this thing into a scary one-off, into a repeat game where people say, I work for Silicon Valley, right? Uh, and, and it just changes the whole thing. People often say in life, you know, that so-and-so was really successful. But you know, they, they worked hard and they were intelligent, but they had a couple of unfair advantages. They had money and connections. Well, guess what? A venture capitalist is somebody who, who, who connects with a founder who has got drive and intelligence, but adds in the money and the connections, right? So in that sense, venture capital is a, a, a leveling experience. Now, my book is this story of you know, technology investment, as I said, you know, from the 50s and 60s right up until today. And it's really doing a couple of different things. It's explaining how venture capitalists think about allocating capital. It's a totally different investment skill to being a hedge fund investor or whatever. Most investment, there are quantitative metrics, a price earnings ratio, a book to value ratio, you discount future cash flows, all that stuff. With early stage investing, you've got two-legged mammals who walk into your office with a dream, and you have to decide whether you're going to bet on that or not. Right? It's, it's a totally non-quantitative uh, kind of exercise. So even to understand how you allocate capital is an intellectual puzzle, a mystery I wanted to kind of unravel. So I do that in my book, and I also explain a bit about the impact of, of VC and whether it's creating too much disruption, not enough, and whatever. But the basic message I wanted to leave you with in this short talk is this very simple one, that venture capital changes culture. Venture capital liberates talent. Venture capital is a machine for manufacturing courage. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sebastian. Um, I, 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 to some extent, I guess my, my next question applies to really, I guess, all, all finance and in, in in, 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 at the operating at a significant level. And so when I, I, saw, I, I went to start a business school in 1994, um, you know, very few people uh, uh, coming out of that were, were thinking about venture capital as a career. Now, of course, the status, uh, the, the vast majority were seeking to go to Goldman Sachs and, and, and establish investment banks as, as such. But today, I mean, I'm, I'm not there, you know, I'm in, in the recruiting halls of, of, of my business school, but I have to imagine that things have changed dramatically where, you know, now, even if the numbers are still going towards, if you look, traditional Wall Street banks, uh, the sexiness of, of wanting to, you know, work for Kleiner Perkins and, 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 and so my question is, I mean, uh, you, I'm sure you, you'll remember the movie The Big Short and the book, of course, that, that preceded it, and there's a line towards the beginning where he, 
I think it's Ryan Gosling is doing a voiceover. We're talking about how the banker goes from uh, the golf club to the strip club, and and how the, their success starts to, in a sense, corrupt their culture. Uh, you, you could argue. I'm sure they, they might think differently. I, I'm wondering in, 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 in the, if you feel there are similar things, whereas as, as venture capital goes from something that was really very much a partner with the researchers, with the engineers, with the people at the face, to something where now they're, they're sought after socially, uh, you know, and, and, and the, their appeal goes far beyond just their, their previous preserve of basically enabling nerds, if you will. Do you see that changing in a, in a good way or bad way? I think it has changed. Um, you know, early on in the story, uh, the kind of prototypical venture capitalist was very much behind the scenes. You know, the coach behind the player. The player was on stage. The player was the entrepreneur. The player got the, you know, the, the credit, the limelight. And the VC was deliberately kind of low-key. Um, Arthur Rock was the chairman of Intel, for like 20 years, he was the main investor who formed it. I mean, most people haven't heard of him. Uh, and they have heard of you know, uh, Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore, uh, who, were the, who were the technical founders. Um, so that was the kind of behind the scenes uh, shtick. And it didn't mean that these people were retiring violets. I mean, Don Valentine, one of the early venture capitalists I write about, you know, was a former uh, Navy water polo player and uh, a really, tough, big guy, and you know, he, his, his, his sort of special source was he could deal with crazy entrepreneurs, and by physical as well as uh, intellectual presence, kind of make them do what he wanted. So there were these crazy guys who did Atari, the first gaming company, and um, they held their board meetings in a hot tub. You had to basically take your clothes off if you wanted to invest in their company, because that's how they operated. And so Don Valentine took his shirt off, and immediately his authority went up, not down. He gets in the hot tub, and he basically tells them what to do. Uh, and so they, they were tough people, but they were very much behind the scenes. Now today, fast forward, and you've got people like Mark Andreessen, who's just a media machine. He's turned Andreessen Horowitz into a media company, right, with its own sort of you know, blogs and podcasts and sort of megaphone, megaphone. And so it has changed. And in some sense, there's this term, actually, I think they use it maybe in India a bit, but you know, instead of saying investor, they say promoter, you know, a promoter. It's kind of like a South Sea bubble kind of phrase. I think you know, VCs have become promoters slightly, right, mm -hmm. some of the time. For sure. And it's not, it's not necessarily a good thing, mm -hmm. but in a world where you're doing consumer-facing tech and you've got to get that network flywheel started and it's about creating a big splash, you can understand why it happens. Yeah. Uh, one, one, one quick follow up question is, is this is probably a, a question that you could do an entire talk on, but uh, you mentioned you, you, you drew many contrasts to Silicon Valley and, and Europe uh, in terms of being culturally quite different, at least particularly in this area. So, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a question obviously many regions of the world have sought to try and figure out is how do we replicate Silicon Valley? Uh, so, do you have a quick answer for that? Yeah, I mean, I'm fundamentally. <laughs> Optimistic, I think that the story about India, where really you have a big tech ecosystem today, is being replicated elsewhere. China is the furthest along. It basically has a tech ecosystem as big as America's now. Um, India, maybe India and Israel kind of come after that. Um, but Europe is doing really well. If you look at the curve of number of venture capitalists, number of deals done, number of unicorns created, you know, all of that stuff is taking off. We know that Europe has more trained software engineers than the United States. It's got a bigger consumer market than the United States. And my view is if you add in the venture capital and that de-risking function that venture capitalists provide, mm -hmm. Europe is going to be an incredible place in terms of the growth of tech. So I'm super optimistic about it. Great, okay, so it's just a matter of time, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Sebastian, thank you so sure. much. Thank you.